Hi, everybody. It's your pilot speaking. God, that's a strange looking pilot. Looks like I have no arms. Oh, well, I'm a pirate, a, pi a pilot torso. I hope you folks are doing okay. Um, as you probably anticipate, we do have an exam to do next week. That's uh, finals week. Um, so I thought I'd start off talking a little bit about that. Um, I did send out something yesterday. Hopefully you, you received that email that came from iLearn, but let's take a few minutes and, and go over our uh, plans for, for the exam for next week. All right. Oops. So uh, the way we're going to do this is we are going to give you multiple days to take the exam. Um, the exam can be taken anytime between um, uh, midnight on, uh, I guess, Monday morning, so 12 a.m. Monday morning through midnight Thursday, and that will allow me to uh, have enough time to grade it. I have to get my grades into the university at Monday, and I want to make sure I can spend Friday and, and part of the weekend grading you folks, um, and then I have to submit the grades on Monday. So that should give you enough time between Monday and Thursday. By the way, it has to be completed by midnight Thursday. I've noticed a lot of you like to wait to the very last minute to take the exam, which is completely fine. I assume you've been studying uh, nonstop for that entire week and want to wait to the last minute. That's fine, but you do have to complete the exam by midnight. That's when I learn closes off the exam. So you have to start by, you know, for an 80 minute exam, you have to start by uh, uh, 1030 or a little 1040, I guess. Uh, it's going to cover all the materials since all the lecture materials since our last exam. So we did cover a little bit of faces on the second exam, but we'll be covering the rest of our face discussion on the uh, third exam. Uh, and also imitation, which I'll be uh, going through and then concluding today. And then we'll be talking about audiovisual speech perception for Pottery today. And then hopefully uh, we'll finish that up and talk at least a little bit about multisensory perception in general on Thursday. Um, the discussion of this section material is sadly just from one section, the sections you folks just had, the one yesterday and, and or if you had it Friday on Friday. Um, so there will be material taken right from that section, that, that one section, um, and uh, uh, at least two questions, probably three. Um, but we'll also um, uh, hold you responsible for the book chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, which in fact do uh, track the uh, lecture material, so eight is faces and nine is imitation, then 10 is audiovisual speech and 11 is multi-sensory perception. Also, by the way, I should, I should have written in there and I'll put that in there on the iLearn site that you should go ahead and, and read the, uh, I guess it's called the epilogue or afterward or something. There's a little section, it's just a few pages, but go ahead and read that. It's important for you to kind of get a big picture on the whole, the whole class in the book, okay? There is going to be review for the course. Um, and that is something that your TAs are preparing and maybe have told you about. They were still deciding how they wanted to do that. I, I don't know if they're actually having a review session or not. If they are, it's going to be recorded to make sure everybody has access to it. Um, they talked about uh, maybe a combination between a review session and um, uh, uh, you know, maybe posting some sort of practice questions or something like that. Um, if they haven't mentioned it yet, um, I would look on the, the discussion section I learned sites. Um, I imagine something will be either posted there or you can contact your TA directly. I, I don't know how they're handling it, but they seemed like they had a good idea of what they wanted to do and, and uh, um, will help you um, prepare for the exam. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. Looks like there are a few. So, um, yeah, so Kari asks, uh, the exam does not cover anything on the other exams. No, you know, there's a tiny bit of stuff that might maybe overlaps a little bit, you know, but you'll see in the multi-sensory chapter, we do talk a little bit about cross-sensory plasticity, but, you know, you won't have to go back and reread or re-listen or anything like that. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, it really wouldn't help you that much. Uh, so yes, it's just everything since the last exam. It is not a cumulative exam. It will be probably between 45 and 50 questions. Um, you know, a, a, again, what we do is just add up all the questions and then the, how many you got right out of that. So uh, we determine it like that. So it's not really weighted more. It just might have a few more questions than the, uh, the other two uh, exams. Okay, uh, other questions uh, about the exam? 
Anything else about the upcoming exam? We'll talk about this a little bit on Thursday again, but I wanna make sure that we, we are cool with this. All right, then let's go ahead and get rid of this silly pilot thing. Although I kind of do look pretty, pretty macho, don't I like this? Yeah, I like it, even without the arms. Um, but uh, we have to make this a little bit easier for you to follow. So we are going to get rid of this. There I am, but we're still gonna do some flying. We're still gonna do some flying as you'll see. Whoa, whoa, this will keep you awake hopefully. All right, so let's go back and continue what we were discussing uh, last class. Get rid of this and expand this. Okay. And to remind you, the, the, the big uh, issue that we're, we're discussing, that we've been discussing over the last few classes is imitation. And um, you know, th there's this new research that's coming out showing that first of all, we are always imitating each other um, in very subtle ways. Uh, that's happening a lot more than I think scientists used to realize. Again, it, it's subtle, so it's not, you know, we don't draw attention to it usually. Um, but it turns out that this, this imitation we're doing is, is kind of helping us in some ways. It now is known that it facilitates our interactions. So it makes us, you know, like each other a little bit more. And then we talked about the fact that um, being imitated actually be, helps you become more altruistic. So you, you know, give your subject money uh, to charity or you help somebody who's just dropped a bunch of pencils more if you have been subtly imitated like that. So there's the social ramifications of imitation, but then there's also these kind of more fundamental perceptual ramifications that we were talking about last week, where you know the imitation we do with our faces, um, uh, the imitation uh, that we do uh, subtly with our, our you know, limbs and things like that uh, seem to facilitate our ability just to perceive very fundamental aspects of other people, including their facial expressions and what their bodies are doing and that sort of thing. And we, we, you know, we talked about um, different ways that, you know, things can be constrained so you can put a pen in your teeth and that might make it harder for you, very subtle differences, but it might make it a little harder for you to, to recognize a frown. Or if you're swinging your arms, you might have a little difficulty recognizing somebody else's postures. They're subtle influences, but the fact that, that something you're doing with your body like this is affecting what we thought was kind of an isolated perceptual process is really interesting. And then we moved into looking at the brain and what's going on with the brain. And so it turns out that not only is imitation useful for social psychology sort of purposes and perceptual psychology sort of purposes, but it actually might tell us something really interesting about the brain. That the brain, as we look at each other, is always doing kind of a little internal imitation or maybe a simulation of what somebody else is doing, right? So you're looking at facial expressions and yes, to some degree you do kind of involve your own facial expressions when you're, when you're doing that. But we now know a little bit more that, that it's not just facial expressions, it's other sorts of actions. And it turns out there's parts of the brain that seem to kind of, as I said, go through a little simulation of what other people are doing. So we are involving our motor system to some degree, our muscles to a small degree, but our motor brain is very active when we're perceiving other people doing things. And the part of the brain we're talking about here, just to remind you, is, a, is the part right here. So this, you're looking at the front. So here, I'll never pass up a chance to put on my brain cap, okay? It is this little strip here. Remember we talked about the sensory strip this right here, the motor strip conveniently is just right in front of it. Very cool. So we're talking about parts of the motor strip there. And we're using our great, great tool, one of my favorite gizmos in psychology, which is this transcranial magnetic stimulation device that temporarily kind of breaks a part of the brain. It, it creates something like a little lesion in the brain. It, it doesn't actually induce a cut or anything like that. It just breaks a part of the brain for a very, very short period and in, very, in a very minor way, but it allows us to see what happens when that occurs. So using those little mouse ears and creating a, a, a little 
uh, break in the brain on the motor area. Here, I should have it this way. This is looking forward like I am right now. The motor area actually not only affects motor skills a little bit, it does like it would make your, maybe your finger wave a little bit if you, if you use TMS there or make it hard for you to clench your fist just a little bit. It actually affects your perception. And we know that through research where people have kind of positioned those little mouse ears over the part of the motor area that is representing the face. And if you do that, okay, so you know, do I have mouse ears? Anything that looks like mouse ears here? No, but you know, pretend these are the mouse ears. Here comes the mouse ears. And I, I kind of direct it right to the face part of the motor area. And I turn it on <clears throat> like that. And one thing you might see is people kind of moving their face a little bit, just a tiny bit, nothing too scary, just kind of involuntarily, that's fine. But then when it comes to actually looking at other people's faces, you find that they will have a little bit more trouble perceiving somebody else's facial emotion. And we also, this is just review now, we talked about the fact that this is also true of uh, weightlifting, um, if you kind of move this uh, device to right over the area on the motor strip here that represents an arm, okay, it does make your arm muscles twitch a tiny bit, okay, but more interestingly for what we're talking about now, it actually affects your perceptual ability to look and at somebody else lifting weights and accurately judge how much weight's being lifted. And uh, I said, you can skip this part. It's not, I, I, it's, it's, it's a little bit beyond it. The, the book talks about the difference, but you could, I should just say this, you can still recognize when the, when that, when the weightlifting perception is affected, you're still recognizing somebody is lifting their, using their arm to lift a weight. It's just the action that seems to be um, uh, inhibited. The perception of the action seems to be inhibited. Okay. What about though, this covert act of, uh, imitation that we've been talking about? So um, we suggested that um, when we are looking at um, a face, an expressing face, a face smiling, a face frowning, we will do a little bit of imitation, very subtle imitation with our own muscles, okay? That's true of faces. Is it true of other body parts? So when we are looking at somebody raising their arm to lift a weight, are they in fact, um, are, are we in fact having our own muscles twitch here? And the answer is, as far as we know, not really, okay? Um, the faces seem to be the only thing that actually activate the muscles. And it's an interesting thing that that seems to be special about faces. However, there is a way you can get the relevant muscles to twitch a little bit as we are watching perceptual acts. So watching somebody lifting a weight or swinging their leg or or um, you know, uh, nodding their head or something like that, you can get those kind of corresponding muscles to twitch a little bit in a different way. So the, what I'm saying here is there's not much of this kind of subtle automatic muscle um, imitation beyond what we've already discussed with faces. However, you can use our old friend TMS in a different way to kind of prime the muscles to do this little imitation. And here's what I mean by that, okay? So um, we have been talking about, ooh, can you see that? Shoot. Okay, sorry about that. We had a little, okay. We've been talking about using those mouse ears to kind of break a part of the brain very briefly. Okay, these are better mouse ears, okay. Um, and it breaks the brain just for a little bit with it, turning it on and making a kind of very strong, uh, uh, um, you know, kind of, I guess, buzz like, like that. It breaks the brain just temporarily the last couple of seconds, right? But you can use TMS for something else, which I haven't talked about yet. And that is applying weak and short pulses to parts of the brain like this. And that doesn't break the brain it actually does something almost opposite. It actually kind of primes the brain um, so that reactions are a little bit more sensitive, okay? So we're not breaking it. We're using a different type of technique with our friend, the, the TMS mouse ears. And rather than going eh, and breaking part of it just for a short time, we're priming it. We're kind of getting excited. I've been in these experiments. That's what it sounds like, okay? Weak, short pulses, 
right here on the motor brain. And when you do that, you essentially prime the muscles that correspond to the action you're looking at. So you're subject to this experiment, the mouse ears are at your at your, your motor area, okay? And rather than breaking your motor area, it's gonna kind of prime and, and kind of get things excited. And that's when you start to see this kind of covert imitation in things that aren't faces, like in arms and things like that. So you go, eh, 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 like that sound? I sound like a dolphin a little bit, eh, 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 like that, um, at the brain. And you're kind of priming the motor system. And so now when you watch somebody lifting weights, measurable little activity can be seen in the muscles that correspond to the action you're watching, okay? So watching hand or arm motions induces activity in hand or arm motions, right? Um, but it is, I mean, it is, we're just using the tool to prime the motor system a little bit, but now you see the corresponding reactions, right? If I'm watching leg motions, there's nothing in my arms that are gonna be twitching, but if I'm watching arm motions, then yeah, my arms are going to be twitching a little bit. It's, it's very subtle. It's like the face thing, you know, it has to be kind of measured with these little electrodes on there. You don't feel anything. But once the brain is kind of primed to be a little bit more excited, you do see kind of corresponding muscles imitating the action you're seeing. And also this is gonna be important because we're gonna be talking about speech perception in, in just a second, um, uh, audio and visual speech perception. It also occurs when you're listening to speech. So that's something scientists were always interested in when it came to imitation. So when you're listening to me speak, are your muscles that are you know, uh, corresponding to the muscles I'm using being activated? So I go, bah, like that. Are your lip muscles activated? Are your jaw muscles activated, your tongue, in the way that you might imitate a bah? And the answer is, in general, no. But if you prime the motor cortex again, <laughs> then you will start to see um, these actions. And you will start to see those actions, whether one is listening to speech or lip reading, which is really interesting. It's gonna to prove to be a, a, a really interesting finding as we talk about lip reading in just a few minutes, okay? So um, if you watch a face speaking, maybe watch a face articulating like that, Regularly, nothing's happening in your speech muscles, but with that priming, <laughs> okay, there are little kind of twitches in those muscles. Maybe that can't be felt, but can certainly be measured using those little electrodes we discussed uh, for the face before. So, you know, the brain always seems to be doing internal imitations of actions it sees other performing and can actually be shown to be active in the muscles if you kind of make the motor system just a tiny bit more sensitive. The actions you then perceive can be kind of subtly, very subtly replicated in our own, our own muscles, our own corresponding muscles. Okay, so that's really cool, I think, because you know, it suggests, wow, we're always imitating, it helps us be social, it helps us to perceive things, and it's giving us insight that even if we can't see it in, in somebody's kind of obvious behavior, deep down, their motor system is imitating the actions that you're seeing. Your motor system is, act, is imitating um, in its processing the actions you're seeing, which leads to a really interesting um, uh, discovery that uh, occurred about 15 years ago. And let me tell you about this. This is one of these kind of great uh, uh, serendipitous sort of discoveries um, where a laboratory, I believe in Italy, I think this laboratory was in Italy, were studying um, uh, the kind of action planning cells in the monkey's brain um, to determine um, uh, you know, which cells were involved in, in kind of initiating action. So it, you know, it was in, by the way, the monkeys are completely comfortable here and, and you know, the, the surgery is pretty non-intrusive and then they, they are treated very well at the end. They have wonderful zoos for these guys. But um, uh, what they do is they, they would record from various cells in the motor area of the monkey in this little motor strip right here. I should have, again, face the brain in the right direction like I'm looking, okay, there we go. It's right here, 
Okay, so they're looking at cells in here, and they have they have little you know electrodes in in these uh, various cells, and the the action they've trained the monkey to do is very simple. It's just um, to to reach out, like here here to reach out like this and grab a raisin and put it in its mouth. This is my raisin. You look like a raisin? Yeah, kind of. Okay, that's it. That's my job as the monkey, and they're they're recording from these cells and. They're finding that, yeah, this is something that, um, oh God. shoot, sorry, sorry, no, God. Um, okay, good, I think we're okay. Um, you know, I just, Adobe blurted something on my screen and said I needed to do something, I ignored it. Hopefully you're still seeing everything okay. Let me know if that's not the case. So we're talking about these action and uh, planning cells, and they are, again, in the motor area of the brain right here. Okay. Cool. That's fine. We, we were able to map out, okay, these are the cells that light up when the monkey is reaching for something. They gave the monkey a little break because, you know, the monkey's going to get tired if they don't. And I don't know if this is true, but this is what I heard, that there were grad students there helping out with the experiments, as there often are, and one of them was a little hungry. So what the grad student does is, well, those raisins don't look too bad. And yeah, they were touched by monkeys, but that monkey's adorable, I don't mind. And so from the other side, the um, grad student reaches out and grabs one of the monkey's raisins and puts it in his mouth. The monkey didn't mind, the monkey was very generous, but something really interesting happened. Those cells in the motor area the ones they thought were only responsible for initiating actions were also responsive to watching somebody else perform the same actions. In this case, the graduate student <laughs> grabbing the raisins that, that the monkey had been doing before when it was actually initiating its own actions. So these are cells that have two jobs in the brain that we never realized could possibly be the case before. We thought there was a separate system for you know, initiating actions, our motor system, and another system for, you know, for vision and uh, uh, you know, touch and hearing and uh, you know, all these other things that we've been talking about. But here are cells in the motor area that respond to initiating actions and to seeing those same movements initiated by somebody else. And because they had this kind of dual purpose, they decided to call these things mirror neurons. And that's a, a very famous concept that, you know, if you become a psychology major, um, you'll learn about it. It's, it's a, a hot topic in, in, you know, kind of the popular press still. When it first came out, boy, was it, we'll talk about its, it, it, the popularity and its application went very far. Um, but it is, it is an, a really useful notion. It seems that there are parts, there are cells in the brain that are responsible for both initiating actions and perceiving those same actions. Um, now, they've learned a lot more about these cells and it, it, it not unsurprisingly, it, it, they have, you know, there are these mirror neurons for other types of actions too, you know, kicking and reaching up rather than forward and, uh, you know, all these other sort of actions that they, they could test with the monkey. And then they tried to see if this also is something that occurred in humans and absolutely there is. Um, they don't do single cell uh, recordings, although they, they have done some. Most of the research that's been done on humans is not at the single cell level, but trying to identify parts of the motor area that seem to respond to both initiating actions and perceiving actions, okay? Uh, so there is this analogous area in the human brain. We now know this, right? And again, just like we found for the monkeys. They are responsive to seeing hand actions. They were responsible for face actions. So now we're getting an idea of really what was going on before when we were using TMS and it was affecting perception, surprisingly. It's because it was affecting perception because these cells have this double duty, okay? Um, they affect action and perception of someone else performing that same action. And you can see where this is going, right? We think maybe this is the sort of, you know, parts, these are the sort of pieces of the brain that are really involved in all this imitation that we've realized is so, so important. It does help with perception and it does help with action in both these things. And they are absolutely, from the last slide, we talked about TMS. Yeah, 
you um, uh, go to where now we know these areas are on the motor strip here, these, these mirror neuron system areas, and you know, use the, T, the, the strong you know, breaking TMS there. And not only does it affect um, a, a person's ability to, to um, you know, perform an action a little bit, like reaching, maybe they don't reach quite as well, they go to the side, maybe their arms don't kind of go as straight as they're supposed to. It also affects one's ability to watch somebody else perform those actions. Maybe they can't easily guess whether the person is on target for grabbing the raisins or something, you know? So you know, it could be something like, uh, here are the raisins and your job is to say, okay, um, you're gonna see just the first part of this movement. Are they gonna grab the raisin if they keep going? And people, this is very easy for us, right? We would say probably yes in that case and probably no in that case. But if you were having that part of your motor area lesioned with TMS, you would have a hard time perceiving somebody else's, okay? Well, here's the deal though with imitation. We find that these cells light up here. That's, this is showing that right here. Let me just move my, my image. These cells light up when the monkey itself reaches for the raisins and the cells light up when the monkey is seeing the grad student reaching for the raisins a little bit more during the motor action versus perceiving the motor action, right? But boy, I wish I had an image of these. These things go crazy when um, the monkey imitates the grad student reaching for the raisins. So if they're, you know, the grad student has his raisins over there, the monkey has his raisins up here. If they're doing it at the same time, these mirror neurons go, yippee, this is great fun. Monkey see, monkey do, that's what I love to, to play. And these cells go crazy. So it is very, very likely that these cells are involved in imitation. They're most active during imitation. And this is possibly, you know, kind of the, the, the heart. We've kind of dug down deep into the brain and found kind of the heart of, the, of, of this imitation that, that these cells probably help us, you know, perceive other people's actions. And as kind of one of the kind of consequences of this, because it's in, in the motor area, um, it is also underlying our imitation. And you can imagine, I mean, when this was discovered, again, be before this, we thought there was a very distinct separation between the nervous system that, uh, you know, uh, coordinated our actions um, in, you know, kind of created um, different sorts of behaviors and the nervous system that was responsible for perceiving the world. But now we know there are these cells that can do both things and those cells seem to be the basis for all this cool imitation stuff we've been seeing over the last few classes. Okay, so it was a really hot topic. It was a big, you know, in the year 2000, you know, between 2005, 2015, say. Um, to the degree, I mean, it was a huge discovery. Um, so people said, oh my gosh, maybe this is the basis of a lot more than just imitation. Maybe this is the basis of things that um, are, are, you know, deeper than that. One of the first things actually I realized, one of the first things that I have on the slide is, is something that people asked about before, and that's yawning, right? Um, and uh, is this an example of, uh, is, should we think of yawning as an example of kind of a reflexive imitation? Because, you know, there is research showing that yawns are, cont yawns, yawns are contagious. Did you yawn? Okay. Um, and, you know, been around people and they're yawning a little bit and you'll yawn right afterwards. You've probably experienced that. Yeah, it probably is a really nice example. And to the degree we understand it, mirror neurons are involved in that sort of reflex. However, this is important to know that even if, you know, it is, it is you know, kind of a, a, it seems like a natural kind of automatic reaction, it really isn't like a true reflex. We don't always yawn when we see somebody else yawn. And to some degree, it, it, it depends on the kind of social situation, obviously, right? So if you came into my office hours and I yawned and then you yawned, oh boy, no, I'm kidding. But um, it, it depends on, for example, how familiar you are with somebody. So you're much more likely to, to show contagious yawning for your family, with your family members than you are with strangers. So yeah, the basis could be the kind of these mirror neuron kind of imitation cells, but other things do play a role in, in whether this works. But what else? Well, what about, it, it helps us perceive other 
people performing actions, right? As I said, it, it, it's, it seems to be useful for that. Can it be something deeper like that? So not just their actions, but what they intend to do. You know, whether, you know, they intend to grab the raisins quickly or slowly or that sort of thing. Um, do they intend us, you know, maybe some sort of harm or some sort of, you know, uh, love, you know, coming up to hug us, that sort of thing. So some folks have argued that it's more than just kind of the basic sorts of actions that we're able to perceive using these kind of simulation, internal simulation cells. It could be the intent behind the actions themselves. And, and there's, there's research to show that might be the case by with the monkey showing that if you show the monkey going towards a raisin, um, but then put a screen on it, the cells, and so the, you can't actually see the contact with the raisin, then um, the cells uh, that are involved in one's own reaching for raisins still will light up. You don't need to see the entire action, but you need to know there's a target there. If you see the animal uh, go towards an empty plate, right, with no target, and then you cover it up, then the cells don't light up. So again, that, that suggests that maybe something deeper than just, you know, like a, a kind of internal imitation of a simple movement is at play here, but maybe we, are having insight into the intention of that movement, which for the monkey's case would be, you know, grabbing the raisins, okay? So that was one of the ideas. And then things kind of got a little, um, I don't know how we should say, uh, I guess mm, fanciful or something. Fanciful. I mean, it was, it was like people started really kind of generalizing, thinking what else could we help explain by understanding these mirror neurons? And there was a proposal made that it actually might be part of the basis of autism, okay? And so we do know some things of the autism, about autism and, and people on the, the spectrum that are relevant here. I shouldn't say it's a completely, you know, nonsensical sort of idea. So we know, for example, that people that um, are, you know, say somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, so they have high functioning autism, maybe Asperger's, something like that they will show less of that kind of facial expression imitation that folks that aren't, you know, towards the middle of the spectrum, people that are, uh, you know, you know uh, we would consider non-autistic or non-Asperger's uh, typically um, show. They are less likely to show imitation. If they're now more towards the more severe end of the autism spectrum, they will not show contagious yawning, even though most of us do in most situations. Um, even with the right social situation, an autistic individual with you know familiar people, their family members, they won't show that. And we also know that there's research showing that people on the spectrum, depending on where they lie on the spectrum, will often have trouble interpreting facial expressions, maybe relating to the fact that they, they um, uh, don't have the same type of mirror neuron systems that the, uh, the uh, non-spectrum public has. And in fact, I, I, I will leave it at this, there is some research, at least initially there was some research to show that when we were, are watching uh, actions by another person, uh, individuals that are you know, on the more severe end of the spectrum do not show the same level of mirror neuron activity as those that are not on the spectrum. Okay, those that are not on the spectrum when you're watching facial expressions, when you're watching somebody reach, you know, all those little cells in the motor area will light up. Individuals with autism don't show that. They will still show, you know, activity in the visual areas and, you know, all that sort of thing, but they will not show that kind of, you know, motor imitation of the brain that seems to be showing up for folks that aren't on the spectrum. Now, research has come out that's kind of questioned that a little bit. And, you know, for those of you that are interested in autism, maybe you, you know folks that are on the spectrum or something like that, you know it's a very complex sort of, sort of uh, uh, you know, issue, uh, the, the spectrum, right? There's a lot going on there and it, it depends on a lot of other things, how people were socialized and all that sort of stuff. But, it, you know, so there are folks that still believe that it certainly isn't the basis of autism, you know, problems with the mirror neuron system, but it might be one of the pieces that plays a role in some difficulties people on the spectrum might have. And then empathy. So 
um, you know, if I asked you to rate your level of empathy, how, how empathetic a person are you on a scale from one to 10? Well, you're taking a psychology class and your young people are all very empathetic, I know. So you might say, I'm very close to a 10. I'm very, very empathetic. Maybe other folks wouldn't. I mean, we maybe have friends or know of politicians who don't seem to be able to show very much empathy, okay? There is a relationship between one's self-evaluation of empathy, self-ratings self of empathy, and mirror neuron system activity. So let's think about somebody very empathetic, Oprah. Oprah, I mean, Oprah is, seems to feel everybody's emotions when she's talking to them, right? That's part of her, her sweetness, part of her appeal. Um, she would probably be somebody that had a lot of mirror neuron system activity while she's watching other people's actions. Where, think about, you know, politicians or people you know that really don't seem very empathetic, and I'm not going to name names because I'm not allowed to, but we know of certain politicians that don't seem to have a lot of empathy, certainly. Um, they probably would show a little less mirror neuron system activity when they're watching simple actions uh, that somebody else is performing. Now, I don't think many people would say uh, uh, that is determining their level of empathy, that their mirror neuron activity is determining their level of empathy. It could, in fact, be a byproduct of, of you know, their empathy that you know, is related to their experience in life and their, you know, their, their neurophysiology in general and all that sort of stuff. But the fact that it is correlated with how people see themselves as empathetic is, is an interesting um, finding, I think. Okay, cool. Let's, this is a good time to take a break. I know there's a lot of information and this is, I understand one of the more technical topics we've discussed along with you know, neuroplasticity, but let's go ahead and see if there's questions and then we will uh, do a polling question. Wow, this is a nice background. This is a, okay. Um, Will there be questions about there? Eric asked, will there be questions on the exam uh, based on the epilogue? Yeah, I think there is one. I think there is one, as I remember. Uh, Roy asked, does this happen naturally without TMS? Okay, I, I'm not sure what you're asking about here, Roya, um, but I'm very interested in what you're asking. So if, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to know what you were referring to when you, when you asked that question. Okay. Um, so when you have a chance, I would I'd be interested. Um, John said, I was going to yawn anyway before you yawn. That's not fair. Okay, I didn't make you yawn. Although I, I, I imagine I often make you yawn. Maybe it wasn't from my contagious yawning. Um, Sam asks, can um, MNS, mirror nervous system activation, be induced using TMS to induce imitation? in autistic individuals. There's your dissertation, Sam. I don't know the answer. So Sam, our wonderful um, uh, TA is asking, can mirror neuron system activation be induced by priming uh, the brain uh, to, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, I guess, um, energize it, activate it in such a way as we talked about before with these little pulses. Can that actually offset the uh, lack of imitation that autistic individuals show? And I don't know, that's a great question. I don't know. Uh, I'd be very interested to see if you find that out, Sam, thank you. Uh, Roy has said about muscle priming for imitation. So yes, um, naturally without TMS. So Roy, uh, yes, um, it happens with faces. So again, the only thing that seems to show this kind of um, uh, natural imitative muscle activity are faces other people watching other people's faces, facial expressions, you do show uh, enough of an imitation from the brain that it does naturally activate the muscles. But at least from 2010, when I wrote the book, I haven't kept up with this completely. I don't think we knew of other instances of kind of other sympathetic muscular actions, like watching a person lifting weight will not, you know, kind of induce activity in our own muscles without that little TMS priming <laughs> sort of thing. So it seemed to be only in phases. Um, okay, Sam's on it, great. Uh, she's gonna find out for us whether this is, uh, whether TMS has been a tool to kind of prime, um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, covert imitation or, or must, uh, mirror neuron system activity using uh, um, TMS. Okay, terrific. Great questions, folks, thank you. Um, okay. Let's do our polling question. It's way down here. Oh yeah, this is easy. Okay, 
We just talked about this. You should not have a problem. This will be on your last exam. This will be on exam three. Applying a weak, short priming pulse of transcranial magnetic stimulation, you know what that is now, to your brain's motor areas would induce subtle activity in your arm muscles when A, your eyes were closed, B, when you were watching someone else's arm movement, C, when you were watching someone else's lip movements, or D, all of the above. Okay, go ahead, take your time. It's kind of a long question, so I'll give you a full minute to do this one. Take your time and think about it. It's right there on your slide. Good luck. All right, yeah, I'm glad we asked this one. This one is a little trickier. It is a little bit more technical. Might wanna go back to your slide just to, to take a quick look if you're confused. All right, cool, let's do this. Um, okay, well, most of you or the, you know, 60% of you got this correct. So I will share the results. Uh, the correct answer is B. Um, it is not all of the above because um, what happens with this priming, it pri you, you, you do use the TMS to kind of, you know, as I said, prime the, the motor area. <laughs> okay, you're not breaking it, you're priming it, you're kind of getting it more excited. And then what you see is corresponding muscles show activity as you're watching somebody else perform an act. Okay, so I'm watching you and you're doing weightlifting. And then <laughs> my little arm muscles would show activity. Nothing else, not my face muscles, not my leg muscles, my arm muscles would show activity. So I'm showing kind of like these sympathetic arm motion or a muscle activity when I'm watching you use your arms, okay? Uh, so that's the case. Now, if I'm watching or listening to you making speech, creating speech, then I'm not gonna, and, and I get primed, <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to show arm, act arm muscle activity. I'm gonna show facial muscle articulator muscle sort of activity. So the activity you see depends on what you're perceiving. Um, but in order to get there, you have to kind of prime that whole motor area first. So that's what that's about. So the correct answer is B. There's only that re reactivity um, in um, uh, in your arm muscles, in your arm muscles, when you're watching somebody else's arm muscles in action. Okay, you got the idea? Good. So, stop sharing there. Are there any other questions? Okay. Then we're gonna shift topics just a tiny bit to continue to talk about imitation, but we're gonna talk about a different aspect of imitation. And if you read ahead a little bit, in the imitation chapter, you know that I met um, the magic teacher at the Magic Castle and I interviewed him. Um, so we're gonna talk about that in just a second, but why don't we do a little magic trick since I have your undivided attention, okay? And the way, I, I'm gonna need a volunteer, but we can just do that. You can, you can you know, turn on your camera or just turn on your sound if you want, or we can just do it through chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Let's see, I'm chat. Who wants to volunteer? Um, who wants to be the volunteer for the uh, magic trick? Should be easy. You can be completely anonymous. We can do the whole thing on chat. Nobody? Oh, okay. So Jenny, Jenny said, Jenny asked to, uh, to volunteer. Thank you, Jenny. So Jenny and I will be interacting. And Jenny, you can turn on your, your sound if you want, or we can just do it through chat, whatever you feel most comfortable doing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, wait. Jenny, you don't want to do it anymore? You said, wait, oh. No, I'll do it. I just said anonymous. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm not telling anyone your last name. Is that okay? It's okay, but I think I'm the only Jenny either way. In, in the whole 250 person class? 
Oh, I didn't, no, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I, I, I think there's lots of Jennies actually. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of Jennies, but you're the best because you're volunteering. Thank you so much, Jenny. All right, the way we're gonna do this, it's a simple card trick and I'm just gonna have you, you know, kind of tell me, this is just a regular old deck of cards and uh, you can verify this for me. This is uh, a regular deck of cards, correct? I'm holding it up to the camera. It's hard for me to see what yeah. you're seeing. Yeah, look like a regular deck of cards. Yeah, yeah. okay, I'm gonna mix it up. Regular overhand shuffle. I'm really bad at shuffling cards as it turns out, um, but I shuffled it, there you go. And now what I'm gonna have you do, Jenny, is I'm gonna kind of start shuffling the cards out like this. And I want you to tell me to stop when you feel that I've actually chosen the right card, all right? Okay. And you can pretend you know what the right card is, all right? Here we go. Okay, you can tell me to stop at any time. Oops, see, I'm really bad at this part today. Oh, I lost a card, that's okay. Stop. Okay, stop. Are you sure? Are you sure you want me to stop here, Jenny? Because I can keep going if you don't feel the, feel the, the, the you know, world move when I, I stop there because you know, the, this is the card you're picking. Okay, you, you want me to go further or you want me to stop? Okay, further. Further, oh, oh God. See, you are the best, Jenny. All right, here we go. Yeah. Say stop again. Stop. Right there, you're sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, you felt the you felt the world move, the earth move. Okay, so Jenny, I'm going to show you your card, and um, I'm going to close my eyes um, so I can't see it. In fact, I, I I don't think Zoom would allow me to see it, but you and the rest of the class can see it, and that's the card you picked. Okay, all right, okay. here we go. Can everyone see the card? Yeah, I saw it. Okay, cool. All right, here's what we're going to do, Jenny. I'm going to put the deck behind my back, and actually, what I'll do is I'll, I'll mix it up again, to, so it's not easy. Okay, I'm gonna put the card behind my back and I'm gonna show you the fastest magic trick in the West. You ready? Because I picked your card, this is it, right? No. No? You wanna see the second fastest trick in the West? Okay. okay. Uh, this is it, right? No, again? Oh mm -hmm. my God. You know, Jenny, when this happens, I've got to rely on something some of us, you know, wanna be magicians have. And it, it's the, I ha happen to have it in my pocket. It's the uh, magician's insurance policy and it, it's right here. And um, this is when magic tricks fail. Uh, in order for this uh, um, policy to, to be applied, all parties involved must be dealing with a full deck. I think that's true of all of us. Um, this policy is valid on Monday through Friday and weekends only. I think we fit that one. And then there's one more here um, that was added. I think it was more recently added. And may, maybe you can read this to us, Jenny. Can you, can you read that right here? What does that say, this one? Maximum benefits are derived when this policy is fully extended. Okay, maximum benefits are derived when this policy is fully extended. What does that mean? Fully, oh. The this that was fully extended means is that right? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's it, right? Uh, what? I'm Thank kidding. you very much. All right, let's talk about magic and perception. Um, so uh, I had a chance to interview the teacher of the Magic Castle. Wonderful guy. And um, we talked about magic and how magicians do their stuff. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research on magic. As it turns out, there's a lot of research on how mag magicians perform tricks that are really interesting to perceptual and cognitive psychologists. In fact, I used to teach a seminar in the psychology of magic and I would take people to the magic castle and everything was great. Um, I'm, I'm switching the topic this year, but, but there's a, a certainly books worth of, of how what we learn from magicians can actually tell us about the brain. It's a really interesting field. Um, oh, there's questions. Uh, no, that's from, that's from before, that's okay. All right, we'll get to the questions later. Okay, so, um, we're going to talk about magic in the context of imitation of eye gaze. And I kind of don't want to tell you that beforehand. Instead, I kind of want you to look at this little magic trick here that's actually performed by a psychologist who's also a practicing magician. Um, it's a simple little magic trick, but I, it, it, the first time I saw it, it absolutely worked on me. Let's see if it works on you folks. Okay, okay let's watch.
Ta-da! Okay. Now, hopefully that worked kind of on some of you. It's not, it's not a very impressive trick, um, but it, you know, if you were a, a naive subject and, talk, and not knowing that we were talking about magic or not knowing that we were talking about eye gaze, okay, it might have worked pretty well. It does usually work on most people the first time they see it. They don't know where the cigarette went. They don't know where the lighter went. Okay? So people come into the experiment. They watch this on a big screen. Okay? Um, and then um, while they're watching, they're wearing a special little baseball cap. Oh, I forgot to bring my baseball cap today. But it's a regular old baseball cap. On the end of it, there's a tiny little specialized camera. And what that camera does is it tracks to see where you're looking on the video's image. Okay, so you know it can track your eye movements by looking at your eye, and it coordinates with where on the screen your eye is pointed to at any one time. So these are very simple to do these days. I think it's a relatively you know cheap sort of apparatus you can buy for I think under five hundred dollars. These specialized caps, and it's great. It allows you to see where psychology subjects are looking when they look at stimuli, and it's helpful for social psychology experiments and and perceptual psychology experiments as we're talking about now. And this is what happens. As they watch the magician, they seem to more or less follow, their eye gaze follows where the magician is looking, okay? Um, so that's what this is showing. Don't worry about the details. I know it's hard to see, but what you're seeing on the top line here is where the observer, where the subject is looking um, as the little magic trick goes on. And so they're looking first, um, I don't know what CH stands for. Uh, oh, cigarette hand. At first, most of the subjects look at the cigarette hand because that's the thing that's moving. Then they look at the magician's face and then they look at the cigarette packet and the magician's face and it goes on and on like this. Now that is what where the subjects are looking. This is where the magician is looking. And you noticed while the magician was performing that skill, um, he was looking in various uh, directions. Here, I can maybe show you the video one more time. Hopefully this will work okay. Um, so you can get a, a, a sense of that. Oh shoot. Uh, it's not working right now. Uh, you don't need it really. Oh, there it is. Okay, watch his eyes, watch where he's looking. He's looking down to the hand, you know, he's looking at his open hand and now he's looking at the other hand, okay? So he's being very, very kind of methodical about where he's looking. And that's part of what magicians do. Because this is showing now where the magician is looking. And then this is just showing you what the actual actions are of the magician's hands, okay? So it says here, um, pick up cigarette pack, take cigarette from the pack, um, place cigarette in the mouth, light cigarette lighter, drop lighter, turn around the cigarette. So probably when I showed it to you that second time, you got a sense of how he was doing it. But here's what happens. When the um, magician is looking somewhere, your gaze as an audience member, as a subject in the experiment, kind of follows um, where he is looking, but with a little bit of a lag, okay? So let's do this. Um, and this is going to be another really crappy magic trick, but um, I'll put this ball into this hand and point to it and look at it and then show you that the ball isn't there, right? But, oh, it's, it, it, it's behind your ear here. Okay, that was the dumbest trick in the world, right? You probably even knew what I was doing, right? But I'm looking here and that is kind of drawing your attention with my gaze to look there as well. Okay. And this is a very, very um, frequent kind of way of misdirecting the audience. Misdirection by eye gaze is one of the most common ways a magician is able to fool you. Because your, your, your attention, if not your actual gaze, goes to where he is looking. And that's exactly what this is showing here, uh, right here. And so it's about a half a second. So the magician, this is showing, the magician looks at the lighter hand and then the observer looks at that lighter hand. And then this is where the magician does the secret move, okay? So the magician looks somewhere, he waits about a half a second, and then he does the secret move, okay? As he's looking at the, the kind of distraction hand. Now, 
I asked, you know, I learned about this before I went and interviewed um, uh, the teacher. And I said, is this something you do? Uh, it, like, you know, um, uh, kind of, you know, with a lot of intention, do you, do you kind of misdirect by gaze and then wait a half a second for them to look? Do you look to see if their eyes are looking and then you do the secret thing? He goes, no, no, this works so well. You don't really even need to count or look at the audience's eyes or anything like that. He knows that the audience's attention is reflexively going where he's looking. It's really interesting. It's a tiny bit more complicated than that though. And I, I think you'll find this really interesting. Um, this is a, another experiment actually performed by the exact same guy, right? There's our, our magician slash uh, uh, researcher right there. And what he's gonna do here is do another really dumb experiment um, where he's gonna throw up a ball and you'll see what happens. Let's show this version of it first. Oh. Ta-da! Okay, so the ball it disappears. Now you probably know where the ball is, but if you hadn't known this was gonna be a magic trick that was gonna talk about gaze and was gonna, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of discuss, you know, have implications for imitation, you probably wouldn't necessarily know where the ball was, right? In fact, when people are asked, how was this done? They would say, oh, the last throw, there must've been somebody above him catching the ball, or it was done with trick photography or something like that, but it's not. In fact, I'll show you another version of it and you'll see exactly what he's doing. Sorry about the sound. So there, you know what he's doing. And that third time he did it, or, or I'm sorry, the, the second version of this, he doesn't do what he did in the first version. The first version, he throws the ball up once for real, twice for real, and then the third time, he doesn't throw it. He keeps it in his palm, but his eyes follow a pretend ball, right? A kind of, a kind of imaginary ball. And what the audience believes happened is that that last ball somehow got off camera. There was somebody up, up above him catching it. In the second version of it, he's not doing that on the third throw. He's going one, two, and then he goes three, but he continues to look at his hand and nobody is fooled by that. They are again fooled by his gaze, okay? But this is, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of this. So this is you know, clearly gaze misdirection. We've been talking about this. Again, it's, it's eye tracking. We just discussed what that involves. The audience, or in this case, the subjects are wearing little um, uh, hats on their head that have these little cameras that are tracking where their eyes are looking in the image. And Here's what the interesting thing about this is. What I'm showing down there is the results of the actual eye tracking, okay? Um, and this is showing what's happening um, on the first throw. And you can see these little dots here are indicating that the eyes are actually tracking the ball. And on the second throw, yeah, they are tracking the ball. Now on the third throw, okay, even though he is looking up, our eyes don't fully track the ball. So this is a little bit, I kind of, you know, I'm kind of fine tuning what I said before about your gaze is automatically going to imitate the magician's gaze, okay? Because here the eyes don't, aren't quite fooled, okay? The eyes will follow the ball in this case, not the magician's gaze, okay? Then does it still work? Yeah. People who showed this, that showed that they really, their eyes really weren't following a fictitious ball. They weren't following the magician's gaze, which implied a fantasy ball going up. It really kind of stopped. It kind of, you know, it went a little bit and then went, oop, nope, the ball's not up there. Okay. So the eyes are kind of tracking the ball. Does it work for those people? Yeah. Those same people whose eyes aren't fooled are perceptually fooled into thinking the ball went up, up, up over the, you know, out of the, the, the frame and somebody was above him and caught it right? That's how it was done. Or somehow it stuck to the, the, you know, something above him or it was done with trick photography. So what this suggests is that your experience is fooled. Your attention follows the gaze of the magician, even if your eyes don't always literally do that. So in that previous example, I showed you that, you know, I kind of implied that eye gaze is something reflexive and to some degree it is, but it's not always. What is reflexively following the gaze of the magician is your attention, okay? 
And that's how he's able to fool you. And in fact, this is something that the, the teacher at the Magic Castle said very, very clearly. He said, you know, uh, when, I, when I do something like this and I'm looking at the empty hand, I don't wait for them to look um, because I can't tell where their attention is going. I assume it is here, but their eyes might not be here. You know, I have, I, the, the eyes, watching the eyes is not that good a metric. I just know that their attention works because you know he'd been doing it for years and years and he knows that the trick works, all right? So it's almost as if in these situations, you're fooled, you're perceptually fooled, your experience is of being fooled, but your eyes might not actually be literally tracking the same thing the magician is tracking. What is tracking the magician's gaze where he is looking or where she's looking is your attention. And that's how this sort of gaze in this direction uh, works. That's why it's so effective. It is the uh, sort of thing that even if your eyes aren't necessarily moving in that direction, although they often do, okay, your attention does. So you can say, I'm, I'm still looking at his face, but your attention, you know, your field of view is big and you can attend to different things in your field of view, even if you're looking straight on. And that's exactly what happens in the case of these experiments and in magic in general. Okay. And there is more research showing that how we can't, how our attention always seems to, to, to follow another person's gaze where the person is looking. There's lots of research showing that it's very effective. And, and you know, if you step back and think about it, it, it you know, makes evolutionary sense. If someone all of a sudden looks like this, you want to know what they're looking at, right? It, it could be something that's threatening, you know? Um, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a good thing that our attention is drawn by somebody else's gaze, that's good. But it is one of these imitative sort of actions that, that absolutely occur like this. Okay, how are we doing here? Uh, good, okay, so I'm gonna stop our discussion on imitation there. And um, I wanted to see if there's any questions. I wanna, I wanna um, delay our polling question just for a couple of seconds, but let me, okay. Quit that, oh, there I am. Um, so let's see, are there any polling questions? I know a lot of people wanted to volunteer. Um, is that trick on TikTok? <laughs> I, hopefully that's not one of the better, there are very, there's some very good tricks on TikTok. Um, oh, people liked, <laughs> I like the reactions from the magic trick. I take that, even if some of them are a little profane, I, I, I'm glad they worked on you. Um, how, uh, how'd you do that trick? I, I don't know how I did it. I have no idea. Um, okay. Uh, oh, someone wants to, Maya wants to learn that trick on TikTok. Okay. Um, I don't have TikTok, Jenny. <laughs> My kids do. Um, but I know what it is. I've seen little clips of it and stuff like that. I, I saw the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, Fleetwood Mac one. That one made all the rounds. Okay. Terrific. Then let's go ahead and shift our topic a little bit. And so what we're going to be discussing now is a topic that we study in my laboratory in a lot of detail, and that is multi-sensory speech. Okay, so let's go ahead and share that screen, share our computer sound, and I think we're ready to go. Okay, oops, yeah. So the person you are seeing here is Sue Thomas. And uh, so it actually, uh, yes, this is Sue right here. Um, and uh, um, she was a professional lip reader for the FBI. Now, I, I, I assume you have some sense of, of what lip reading means in this context, right? This is, this is the type of silent lip reading that um, we'd be talking about uh, um, where you couldn't hear what a person was saying. So you hit the mute button on, on the news and you see somebody talking, um, you know, we feel like we can't get a whole lot of information from that talking face without sound. But someone like Sue, who was deaf from a very, very early age, in fact, can. And um, what happened with Sue is kind of an interesting story. Um, let me just uh, get this set up here. Da, 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 da. Uh, yes. Um, Sue lost her hearing at 18 months. Um, she did actually have, by then, have a, a little bit of a language capability. Okay, 18 months, you do learn words and, and things like that. But she did lose all of her, 
her um, hearing at that age. I think from meningitis, if I remember correctly. Certainly, the the book will will tell you about that. And um, uh, she um, so that was before most of her language acquisition. Uh, she did receive intensive therapy, though, and it was not for lip reading. And this is kind of interesting. Um, her therapy over the course of seven years was for speaking clearly. So you might know this, that individuals who are profoundly deaf, who are very, very deaf and don't have cochlear implants, um, sometimes their speech is a little distorted. It's a little hard to understand them. And that's because they don't have the normal auditory feedback the rest of us do to kind of make sure our speech can be understood. So in the old days, before cochlear implants, people used to go through speech production therapy so their speech could be understandable to other people. And that's exactly what she did for seven years, intensive years, um, and then practiced at home with her mother all the time. But an important component of this, okay, is looking in the mirror as you are speaking, okay? So it's called guided production while you're watching yourself very closely in the mirror. So her mirror was very close to her face and she would watch the inside of her mouth and the outside of her mouth as she watched her mom speak or the teacher speak, right? Um, and it, it, you know, it, it got a lot of information about mouths, not only for the improvement of her own speak, you know, when I, when I, her own speech, when I, when I spoke with her, her speech was, was nearly perfect. I, you know, I had no trouble understanding it. Uh, it, down, it may, maybe it sounded like a little bit like she had a little bit of an accent or something, but, but it was completely clear. She had obviously benefited herself from, from this speech production therapy, but kind of as a, a byproduct, she had learned to be an excellent lip reader to the point where she was hired by the FBI to do surveillance on silent um, surveillance videos. So they bring her into a room and, and have on a big screen, you know, one of those videos that's taken, you know, on street corners or, you know, next to stoplights or something like that. Um, and she, you know, she wouldn't be able to hear anything. These things typically don't record any sound. And if they do, they're not gonna record sound from somebody who's a block away but they could zoom in on the faces of the people that were a block away. And um, she would be able to lip read in them and tell the FBI agents what, what they were saying. Um, she got very good at doing that first. And then she ended up going uh, to do um, on-site surveillance where you know, if they were following a suspect, say to the airport, um, and they were they they felt the air they were the suspect was there to meet somebody and and maybe you know organize something criminal at the airport to talk to somebody. What they would do is they'd sit you know uh, quite a ways away um, so they couldn't hear what the suspect was talking to the other suspect about, but they'd be close enough so Sue could watch their mouths speak, watch their mouths move, and and she was able to tell what the suspects were saying in that context as well. And it, it, she, you know, she was really, really successful at it. She did it for a number of years and she decided to move on and do some other things in her life. She's a pretty, very impressive person. I think she's now a, um, an inspirational speaker and, and works with her church and things like that. But she was very successful at what she did and, and, and the FBI continues to employ expert lip readers like this. Sue's case was kind of interesting also because she was one of the first people to, to do this for the FBI. And um, because of that, they decided to make a TV show about her. And that's what you're actually seeing here. This is the woman that played Sue and the dog plays an important role in it. It's called, you can, still, you can see it online. Um, I've seen episodes of it. It's called Sue Thomas colon FBI. And the I is actually the, the word E-Y-E-I. And it's about this expert lip reader who works for the FBI. So, you know, um, uh, it's based on her life. It, it was on... I can't remember which channel. I can't. The, it might have been on the Animal Channel and on second season or something like. That. I can't remember the first. The, I can't remember the first season, but the second season, I think, because the dog played such an important role um, in the, the the story, they they put it on Animal Channel. So you, you could look for it. It's Sue Thomas FBI, and it's 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 nice. It's a nice show. Anyway, so what is it about Sue that makes her such a good lip reader? Well, as as I mentioned. Um, uh, you know, she had this sort of training in front of a mirror and she absolutely believes that that, that is something that, that helped her. You know, I asked her when I, I interviewed her, I said, did you ever think about 
taking any of these lip reading training courses that are available on the internet. And she said, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a lip reading training course available on the internet. I, I can't imagine how something like that might work. Um, you know, I, this is gonna, it takes a, a very, very long time to, you know, uh, kind of get all the nuances and, and producing speech in front of the mirror is probably an important part of that. But I don't think Sue believed, and I don't believe that going online and taking one of these courses is going to be making you a better lip reader. And as you're going to see, you already do some lip reading um, in some very interesting ways, but we'll talk about that in just a second. But what else about Sue might have made her a good lip reader? Well, um, we do know, not surprisingly, that the deaf are probably twice as good, if not more, at lip reading than the hearing folks, right? And that is especially true if they lose their hearing early on or, or they're, they're born deaf and it becomes their primary means of communication, right? They have to rely on it. So they kind of attune to the type of facial information that allows them to be, to be a better lip reader. Other factors, and this is probably true in Sue's case, women tend to be better than men for whatever reason. Um, there's many psychological, you probably know this, uh, there's many kind of psychological processes that women tend to show more ability at than men. Um, this is one of them, lip reading. Uh, something called short-term memory span. It's just, you know, how much information can you keep your, in your short-term memory at one time? And reading speed, how quickly a person can read for comprehension. I'm talking about reading text in a book. And Sue's a, a, a very, very bright person, um, you know, uh, very articulate, very bright. And I, I imagine that her short-term memory span and her reading speed is, is very high. So all those things probably played a role in how good she was as well. But, you know, what I'm, I'm certainly listing here is based on, on research on, on, on uh, good lip readers. Um, there's some other things, and, and it's unclear, you know, um, uh, this is something that that uh, one of my, a current graduate student of mine is, is interested in. And that has to do with the neuroplasticity of deaf individuals, right? Especially people who've lost their hearing at an early age and whether that might play a role in um, making them better lip readers. And it's, it's a really interesting question and one that we, we talk about a lot in the lab. Um, but there is research that shows some interesting um, other abilities in early deaf individuals. For example, and I think you're gonna find this really interesting. I always thought this was such a cool thing. This is cross-modal plasticity again. This is kind of a compensatory, a, a way for the deaf to compensate for their, their loss of hearing, but it's in a very kind of specific manner that I think you're gonna find interesting. What they show is um, in, along some very particular lines, better visual sensitivity than individuals who are not deaf. And it is kind of limited to motion to some degree, visual motion, seeing things move, you know, being more sensitive to visual motion. And importantly, especially at the periphery of their visual field, things on the side. So when it comes to their ability to use visual information, when it's in the middle, eh, they're not very much better. They're pretty much like people that do hear. But boy, when it gets to the side, they seem to be more sensitive. And I think that's really interesting because what it suggests is that we typically, those of us that are hearing, use hearing as kind of one of uh, the ways that we can war be warned of you know, danger. You know, we, we can hear everything around us at any one time, but we cannot see everything around us at any one time. You know, we can see, you know, about half of it because of our eyes facing forward, right? You know, animals that have eyes on the side of their heads do see more around them. But since our eyes are facing forward, we see you know, a little less than 180 degrees around us. There are things in the back that we can't see. If something is approaching us from the back, outside our field of view, we can hear that. And maybe as soon as we hear it, turn to see what it is. Or if it sounds like something we recognize, like a lion that's coming up from behind, run for our lives forward. A deaf person can't do that. So they compensate with their visual system in a way, and in a way that makes a lot of sense, given this kind of warning aspect of, of sound, that because they can't hear things behind them, they become a little bit more sensitive to things moving on the side of them. So it allows them to maybe see things a little bit sooner 
than the rest of us do that are coming from the side in order to compensate for the lack of that auditory warning system that they have, okay? Um, what else do we know about uh, um, the brains of early deaf individuals? Well, we know that the parts of their brain that respond to sound, and that's right here. It's in the, what we call the temporal lobe here. Um, right there, there's a little ear there on this, right? That responds to sound. But in deaf individuals, um, because there's no sound, it seems to kind of get shifted. Its purpose seems to get shifted and get shifted for things that might normally be conveying sound. So sign language, because you know the deaf um, aren't um, uh, you know using a spoken language; they're using a sign language. Their auditory areas now get reassigned for being very good at deciphering signs that are in front of them. So you know it, it's it's kind of like the plasticity we saw and discussed with regard to blind individuals, with deaf individuals, that this kind of com compensation seems to be very sensible and seems to be based on this cross sensory plasticity that you see with these individuals. Okay, um, how are we doing here? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think we can, we can stop here and do a polling question and see if there's any questions and then start, uh, continue talking about uh, lip reading, um, multi-sensory speech and you'll learn next time that it's in fact something that you do all the time to some small degree. So let's do this. See if there's any questions first. <laughs> this, this isn't a question about the content. You wanna know how you did the trick? If I knew how I did it, I would absolutely share, share it with you, but I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay, anyway, I can't tell you that, you know that. Um, okay, let's do our polling question then. And this will be a very simple one because we just discussed the topic. All right. Oops. Yeah. Good. This has to do with um, the magician and eye gaze. Um, slide a hand magic. That's the other term um, that's used for this, right? Slide a hand when I, you know, when you're making something disappear. All right. All right. Ta da. Okay. That's sleight of hand magic. Research on sleight of hand magic, like we've been discussing, shows that A, even if your eyes don't follow the eye gaze of a magi magician, your attention does. B, even if your attention doesn't follow the eye gaze of a magician, magician, your eyes do. This is a little tricky. I understand that. Read it carefully. C, both eye gaze and attention always follows the eye gaze of the magician or D, none of the above. Read these carefully. It is a little tricky, but the correct answer is there and it's right from your slide. Most of you are doing really well. And even if you're not doing really well, it's no problem. This is all anonymous and um, uh, has no bearing on your grade. It's a good time to fail a question. Okay. Uh, let's make sure we can, can finish this before the class is over. I'm going to end it here and share it with you. Most people got it right. 56% uh, of you got it correct. Um, the answer is A. So um, the first example, the first slide I showed you where it was that cigarette experiment, it did show that eye gaze often did follow the gaze of the magician, okay? So that's sometimes what occurs. Um, but even if that doesn't occur, which I showed in that second slide with the ball being thrown up, okay? Your eye might not literally follow the magician's eyes. It often does, but it might not literally follow the magician's eyes. You could watch just their face. What does follow them is your attention. Your attention follows their gaze. So even if you're looking straight ahead at their face, part of you know what's in your visual field is the ball being thrown up or the fictitious ball being thrown up and your attention will go where the magician is looking, even if the eye gaze in this case doesn't. So the correct answer is A. 
Um, B is incorrect. So if your attention doesn't follow the eye gaze of magicians, your eyes do. No, your eyes do not necessarily always follow the magician. Often they do, but not always. And both eye gaze and attention always follows the ma magician's eye gaze. No. Remember, there are certainly cases where eye gaze might not literally follow somebody else's gaze, right? Even if that's the case, what follows is your attention without your eyes moving. Just think about the fact that when you look at a scene, you look straight ahead, as I'm doing right now in the mountains, um, I can attend to different parts of this room or of the mountain, right? You can attend to different things even without. It. And that's what happens. Your attention will in fact follow the eye gaze of the magician, even if your eyes don't literally move. Okay, there you go. Um, we'll continue the discussion of visual speech perception and audiovisual speech perception on Thursday. Okay, there we go. All right, have a good few days.